good afternoon to all. So I'm Daniel Ekbe. Daniel, you can be Ekbe. I'm going to present on, on the renewable energy potentials and application in Africa. I am the international coordinator of uh, ANSOL, African Network for Solar Energy. And, um, and I'm also um, scientifically based at uh, the University of, of Linz in Austria. And so all head offices in Germany. Uh, yeah, so I'm between two cities, uh, Jena in Germany and Linz in Austria. So on the second slide, you just have a, my CV, just some points about me, who am I? Uh, so, Daniel, I could you, could you, um, you know, um, make the slides bigger, like share it on the full screen? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to do it. <laughs> Presentation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm originally from Cameroon, and if you if you are reading this uh, slide, you will see that I've uh, I've gone through many stations in my life within uh, Cameroon itself. Then later I came to Germany and uh, to do my master PhD and habilitation. I'm the first Cameroonian who did an habilitation in chemistry in uh, Germany. Then had some postdoctoral stays in, in Eindhoven, came back to Germany, then went to Linz since Linz, Austria since 2009. I'm, I've initiated uh, a quite of numbers of institutions, I could say scientific institution um, and others. So you can read, uh, I'm a board member of the Soko World University Service. This is an NGO um, whose motto is Human Rights for Education, and which now which will be 100 years old this year. And I initiated the German Cameroonian Coordination Office in Cameroon, then the Unsolved African Network for Solar Energy. And I'm also the, I'm the chairperson of uh, Unsolved EV, it's an NGO legally representing Unsolved. And I initiated an, uh, another network called Balua, Bridging Africa, Latin America, and Europe on water renewable energy applications. Um, I'm an independent evaluator of the World Bank Group and African government in capacity building issues. So, and many other things. And I'm in scientific councils of different institutions and uh, yeah. I speak many languages, and I think uh, through the languages, uh, I'm able to to carry out my various activities. Lang languages open a door, many, many doors. Um, and I'm a father of four children. I love dancing salsa, so um, I will continue with this statement: uh, the inconsiderate cap uh, capitalistic technological development has fostered environmental underdevelopment characterized by extinction of many biological species, air pollution and climate change, among other th effects. Working with air filtering masks in, in, in Peking or in Beijing is a clear evidence of underdevelopment. As such, the underdeveloped are the developed. This is a funny, is a philosophical st statement that the underdeveloped are the developed because the underdeveloped are those who have not been strongly influenced by uh, technological uh, development. If we take the case of Germany where I am, uh, there have been uh, a large extinction of many insects uh, in the, uh, due to the, uh, uh, um, the agricultural manipulations, what is going on on agricultural fields. So, uh, so the, the natural, highly developed state created by God is no more there. So we cannot be talking about development when many species have instinct, when, when the air is polluted. So the underdeveloped are the developed means those who are still under the natural 
uh, environment ecosystem are they developed. So this is the idea behind it. And I think that's why the, the sustainable development goals were introduced to say that not only the so-called underdeveloped country or third world countries uh, need to think about the environmental issue, uh, but also the so-called developed countries are, have become underdeveloped due to uh, excess, as I was putting already, um, this capitalistic exploitation of the environment. And um, the one former German minister who was uh, the UN director of uh, UN um, uh, 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 Agency of, um, of Environment, the base in uh, Nairobi, he was one of the, those who developed these uh, SDGs. And he, I, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, here in Yena during the talk where he said, he, during his stay in, in Nairobi, the idea came uh, where he was reflecting and said they have to do something for the world. And um, where, whereby developed countries should uh, have a contribution that every country is underdeveloped. It's no more third world countries, so called third world countries, which are underdeveloped, but everyone has to contribute in, in the framework of these SDGs. Um, so, and um, our network, Af the African Network for Solar Energy where I'm, that I'm leading, is um, going to, towards that goal. <clears throat> Although our main focus is capacity building in renewable energy. And as you see for the SDGs, SDG number four is access to affordable and, and, and clean energy for all by the year 2030. And we are trying within the network uh, to uh, implement this idea by capacity building. So uh, this slide briefly give you uh, some points about the network. It is almost uh, it's old, nine years old now. I, I initiated it and we launched it uh, on the 4th of February 2011 after the initiation in uh, the 4th of November 2010 in Sus, Tunisia. And it's now reached out as an NGO in, in Germany, as Ansel EV. So we do uh, training, education, research. So the idea of entrepreneurship, uh, we have to be part of the whole uh, picture. We have not yet really started, but we are working for that. Um, we, are, we now have more than 1,000 members in 45 African countries and 31 non-African countries. And um, more than 80 percent of our members are from the academics, uh, so from more than 300 universities, uh, mostly from Africa, but also worldwide. We find our members in the U.S. and and and, and, and many European countries and, and elsewhere. So we've organized more than 30 scientific events and so far, and we have some scholarship program. Uh, but uh, the sponsors of the scholarship. Uh, decided to stop out of, I think, geopolitics and uh, it's not always easy for uh, Africans to do something good for their continent. Um, yeah, because of geopolitics. I don't go into details, but we, we succeeded to uh, graduate a few number of, of, of PhDs and we are now working in Togo, Benin, and some have got international job working now in, in India. So I'm proud, I'm proud of the few, for five, we had scholarship program for around four years, so we have four or five years, and then uh, the finances stopped. So, and um, we, we have three, as, as an NGO, Richter in Germany, we are here in, in Jena, where I'm based, where I'm now talking, uh, we have uh, our offices, and then we have a program called uh, AMA, Unlaunched Telephone Mention African Asia Health, which means focal point for people of African origin. And there we take care of Africans, uh, students, refugees, and here in our city. And our main focus, our main uh, activity is anti-racism anti activities. We had a demonstration just last week on the, on the 25th where I had to give a, a speech on, uh, uh, yeah, during the demonstration on, on after almost one month after George, uh, the death of George Floyd. So 
and um, and we try, yeah, to mention the fact that uh, there is only one race. And I I like you to for those who have never heard about the the Yena Declaration, with the title "The Concept of Race is a Result of Racism and Not Its Prerequisite." Um, I'll just read this excerpt. Just I took it because it's very important for for us to know. Uh, uh, this to have ideas about what is going on on this thematic of uh, racism. Uh, this SF says it was mostly through scientific research on genetic variation among and between human population that the concept of race was finally exposed as a typological construct. Among humans, by far the largest share of genetic differences exist not between ge geographical populations. But within such groups, the greatest genetic variation is still in people on the African continent, where the roots and most of the branches of the human family tree are located. The people of East Africa and all non-African gathered together on one of its branches. Therefore, people outside Africa are most closely related to people from East Africa, such, such as the Hadza, than the Hadza or non-Africans uh, to people from South Africa, for example, the Khoisan. From the phylogenetic point of view, all people are therefore Africans. So all of us are Africans. In consequence, it is positively paradoxical to talk of the African or the Black Africans. This is a relic of colonial ways of speaking and thinking. And once again, it is a case of racism creating races. The skin color of a a cousin from South Africa is lighter than that of people who live in Southeast Asia or South America along the equator. Skin color mainly reflects a biological adaptation to the level of solar radiation and consequently varies continuously in line with the intensity of UV radiation on Earth. So the message here and what I want to transfer that all of us, we emanate from Africa, so all of us are African. So we and I'm, I'm proud to to say to 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 make this statement so and uh, so based on that there, there are no races so the, the the difference in skin color is just uh based where you are the biological adaptation adaptation to uh, the level of uh, solar radiation and uh as i said we have initiated not only ansol but also uh, uh balewa bridging africa latin america and europe where uh, and on, on, on renewable energy and water. Um, while I was invited to give a lecture in Brazil, 2015, where we, I discovered that there, there was very li little uh, scientific uh, interaction between African scientists and, uh, and South Latin American when it comes to water and renewable energy uh, uh, research. So we, we started a platform and it was launched in uh, 2000, officially launched in 2016 in Arusha, uh, Tanzania. So uh, through this platform, we are planning a summer school among our summer school uh, uh, initiative. We've had so far three summer schools on uh, only renew renewable energy. The fourth will be on, on, on water on SDG six, and this is planned for. I hope when things will, when the shutdown will be over in in, in Kigali, Rwanda. And our main sponsor is the Volkswagen Foundation. So we had a series of events that we were planning this year, but we've, uh, we have to shift some. Uh, yeah. um, so our main uh, event, which is upcoming event, will be the 10th anniversary uh, of Ansol in Sous, Tunisia next year, from the 2nd to the 5th of February. Uh, let me come up to the outline of my talk. I'm going to briefly give you some, I, some give show, show some slide on my research and research issues. And I'm going to talk about research issues in Africa, then continue with uh, energy context in Africa, and yeah, renewable energy resources potential in Africa, and um, renewable energy policies in Africa, then training education and research program. Yeah. I'm, my research field, I work on um, organic semiconductors, I'm an organic chemist of, of, from trade, so I, I 
uh, produce material, a synthesized material, used for different optoelectronic applications. Uh, so you can see here on the left hand side the different type of colors which a chemist can produce. Uh, yeah. And these materials are used for organic light emitting diodes, organic photovoltaics, transistors, and uh, memory devices, as uh, to just to name a few of a few applications. So, um, and as I said, they can be used also in uh, organic uh, uh, in, in in organic photovoltaics. And when we talk of renewable energies. Uh, we have on the on this slide on the, my left front side on the, here the different type of renewable energies. Uh, yeah, and under solar energy we have the solar thermics and photovoltaics, and the different photovoltaics uh, are shown here: the first generation, second generation, and the third generation. The organic organic photovoltaics are of the third generation, and now the efficiency has uh, got up to more than 17 percent and then we have the of the, the last years the perovskite came in and uh, showing efficiency of uh, above 20 percent so um, you can find application of organic uh, photovoltaics already uh, on small gadgets like uh, solar bags and here you have some massages uh, uh, I hope you are seeing my, my uh, cursor. So using flexible organic solar cells to charge their cell phone. Uh, then on the um, um, African Union Peace and Security Building in Addis Ababa, uh, you, you can see this African map made up of organic solar cells. So. Um, one can also put some uh, combine, <clears throat> make dresses using organic solar cells um, and light emitting diodes. So this is uh, uh, there are people working on it, trying to design uh, clothes having organic solar cells and also organic light emitting diodes. So um, the good thing with my research, uh, we try to produce also beautiful images which are uh, which we use for for us to do exposition uh, photo exposition which I've done to in many places hospitals and banks and so so it's a, it's a nice thing and last uh, last year yeah that was last two year yeah I won the, the prize of the best um, pictures from science uh, wonders of science at the University of Linz uh, where this picture that you are seeing, uh, yeah. So you have the impression it's the globe, uh, yeah. But it's uh, a round bottom flask having a um, a material which shows blue fluorescence. So, so yeah, it's uh, as I said, you won the best the best uh, prize for the, the the highest the first prize for of uh, competition at uh, the University of Linz where I am. So I'm, I'm still in my, my, in this lecture, I'm still on this aspect of my research, but I'm, I'm trying to move now towards the problem of research in Africa. Why am I presenting this paper? This is a paper which was, yeah, which we got this Nature Photonic paper, thanks to uh, this lady who, who came to our lab uh, from Morocco using our Ansol scholarship program, the Annex program, Africa North Exchange program. Um, and she came and used this material, this is my polymer that you can see here, this is an anthracene based material, to do um, um, a flexible and uh, ultra thin polymer light emitting diode. And uh, so she succeeded. And we had to publish in uh, Nature Photonics. Uh, you can see many Africans who are in Europe or in North America are, are excelling. But in Africa itself, uh, research and development has been neglected by our governments. Yeah. Africa has 13.4% of the world population. 
uh, but only 92 researchers per million habitants. In the global scientific publication, just 1.4 percent. And Africans are contributing only 0.41 percent of their GDP yeah. for research and, and development. Oh, no. As compared to uh, 2.1 percent for Asia and 2.4 percent for North America and Europe. <clears throat> so here you have investment in research and development as um, as percentage of GDP. So Israel is the leading country with 4.27% followed by South Korea. And then you can see very down Uganda with 0.1%. And it is not even the lowest. You have some other countries like Sierra Leone and, and who are even, even below uh, that. So you, 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 uh, most African countries, apart from South Africa, which is the, when you go on this uh, chart, you will see South African have the around 0.8 percent. Uh, the rank worldwide, worldwide uh, number 44. Um, then comes Kenya, which is also trying, and and the, then the, the rest of uh, 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 of African countries. So, so most African countries are not putting money in research and development, and we are talking in Africa about. Uh, the agenda 2063, where we are there with the slogan, the Africa we want. We cannot come to implement or achieve this agenda if we don't put in money in education and research and development. And if we don't also adapt our curricula to our African reality to the african reality our curriculums are eurocentric most african have, don't don't have a clue about their own history about what the africans have contributed in science in 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 in, in, in philosophy in, in in many many things we don't have a clue myself i don't know where my my group or my tribe come from so those are things that are necessary for us not only to be uh, how can i put it not only to to have uh, this inferiority complex that many africans have towards uh, the west uh, because we are taught uh, based on the western educational system and we, we know more about the Western history, about what they have done, and so on. But we know little about ourselves. And this is a big issue which, uh, uh, which ought, ought to be uh, uh, tackled. So we have to change our curricula in, in the schools. And we have to put a lot of money in research and development. If not, uh, we will we'll make a lot of slogans, make new agendas, but nothing will change. So if you can see, the share of external research and development funding. Most African countries depend on foreign aid to, for their research. And a country like, uh, I would take, like uh, Uganda, more than 55, uh, 50, yeah, almost 60% of his uh, research funds come from, from abroad. And Mozambique is worse, almost 80%. So the government is doing nothing. So, but our government has to do something. He who gives money dictates what you research on. And this is what uh, this guy is saying here on this. Uh, so, uh, so, so long as we depend on foreign aids, we cannot really do uh, research, Africa focused research. So, uh, and this slide gives you the challenges that young, uh, young researchers have, 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 have uh, <clears throat> brought up when it comes to uh, research in Africa. And the, 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 in the ranking, the top is lack of research funding. This is a big issue. Um, in France, in France, almost more than 50% of the researchers are foreigners. And I can say almost uh, three quarter of them come, are coming from Africa. So they are the one giving the knowledge 
in France. But if this, those Africans were, were in their various African countries, in Senegal, in Cameroon, and having the same facilities, then we'll be somewhere else. Our government should wake up and start investing and putting money in research and development. The Africans head of state pledged some few years ago to put 1%, but up to today, uh, how many of them have done? I've done that to put 1% of the GDP, none. And nobody cares about uh, this aspect. And that's, that's where lies uh, the strength of uh, uh, the development of, of the continent. And if we are developed, we can combat racism. All this idea of racism, of uh, inferiority complex and, and uh, white supremacy is because we are not doing much in our education. And our education is Eurocentric. The content is false. And, and, and we are not putting much money in research and development, and that's where we are. And so things have to change. Uh, yeah. And yet, I have a question. Yeah. Hello, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, slide 21, where you're showing the uh, graphics with yeah. uh, all the fundings to, uh, to African 20. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I'm surprised with this, but uh, well, just slightly surprised. But my my curiosity goes to these fundings are coming as what? As grant or as direct money? Uh, most of them are coming abroad? Yeah. in different sources uh, as, as grant. Like you have, uh, let me take Sweden, is funds, uh, at least where I'm, I'm, I've been involved with uh, the, the CEDA funding uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in East Africa, for instance. So they fund uh, research groups, they fund networks. So most of these things, uh, let me also say the EU is funding through uh, EU calls. So there are, there are a lot of money coming from, 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 from abroad. But I want to say, and most of this, this funding has a specific goal. So the EU gives the money, tells you, you have to research on this. You don't yeah. decide on what you are researching on. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, and that's yeah. the, the, the and, and which is a big, a big issue for, for, for Africa. I said, as I'm saying, you are in France, you can say it. And there are many, you are from, from Tunisia. Uh, you, you know how many Tunisians are doing She's excellent from Algeria. work. What? She's Far, from Algeria. I thought you were from Tunisia. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're not good for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. But what are the case? But uh, and especially if the Algerians are so many in France, and you are doing a lot of good work in France. So it's not, yeah. But I, I had the opportunity to, to, to supervise two Algerian students, one from Tibis and one from, from uh, Bijaya. Uh, and they, when they came to my lab, within a few years, would that even good knowledge in chemistry, but they could master the chemistry quickly and finish their PhD, publish good papers, and, and one is now in Canada, the one is back home, and is now an assistant professor. To say that we, but they could do those things at home. Why not? Yes, and this but is what the, you make me your, your graphic here, here is even worse than I was expecting it, because you're saying that many funds are coming uh, from abroad, uh, for the African research, but in addition to this information, you're saying that they are focused on some topics only, and that yeah. is even even worse. Was yeah. even worse. Yes, exactly. That's even worse. This what this guy is saying here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go. Where, where am I? Yeah, this uh, quest of scientific independence. Scientific. Yeah. Independence. We don't have scientific independence. Uh, polling. Yeah. Uh, who Tonji uh, Benin he was uh, making this this aspect because of this strong dependence on foreign uh, aids when it comes to research and development. Okay. And 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 um, and this slide, the next slide that I'm showing, it just gives you um, what I always preach when I visit, I visit many African universities. Um, bec I, as I said, I am involved in World Bank evaluation process and and some uh, international organization uh, evaluation process where we have to select African centers of excellence or African hosting universities. And what I found in many sub-Saharan African universities is the problem of sanitation. Most universities have no good toilets and ladies are the ones suffering. And in many cases, 
we have to reject this application where we do on-site evaluation. So I try to tell people, for this case, you don't need foreign aid. You need to do things yourself. So, and, and yeah. And uh, this slide, I will just leave it there. I think those, you will receive the slide. Um, KTV will send it to you. Or, yeah. For those that, uh, like, Ferus, I, I can send you directly to you. So all the slides, so not a problem. I don't want to go to read all, all through this thing. But yes, the two main, main important information so, here. That there is a, there's another question. Uh, Chilufia, you want to ask your question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm hearing you, yeah. So yeah, Chilufia, um, Chilufia yes. te tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah? I think uh, people will want to know you a little. Just say one or two things oh, wow. about yourself. Okay, my name is uh, Chilufia Mwewa, I'm from Zambia. I attended the very first uh, African School of Physics. Uh, and I just finished my PhD uh, this year and I'm yet to start a postdoc at uh, BNL, where KTV is. <laughs> That's it. Okay, go ahead, ask your question, please. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, I came in late, uh, sorry, so I, I came in, I think, on slide 18, 19, and I just wanted to know if the colors or where you show the percentage GDP, if they mean anything. Which? Um, I think it was slide 19, where you show uh, where the, um, the, yeah, this. Okay, this the color don't, don't, okay, the color don't mean. Mm. Okay, most the um, the higher numbers are of the Western world. Okay, and then comes China and so on. So it doesn't mean anything specific. The most important things are the GDPs, the the, the, okay. the percentage. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. As I said, um, uh, so another aspect which I was saying. Uh, Nowadays, they do through which I also like to say, and which comes on this slide, is uh, uh, the, uh, adopt the fourth industrial revolution, means uh, online class, classes and so on. And where I try to tell lecturers in Africa that uh, a lecturer or, uh, is, or a supervisor is more or less has the role of a mentor. because. You, we find nowadays a lot of information online. So even this lecture, everybody can, if you are, you take time, you can go online, you get a lot of information. And then you, so um, lecturers should not be ashamed uh, to be, okay, should not be ashamed if a student knows more than, more than, more than them. So, because everything is found online, you have bet, I can say you have, you have better lectures on solar energy or whatever by others found online. So if you go YouTube or whatever, you get anything. Uh, so uh, lecturers should be more or less mentors and than only knowledge as the sole knowledge giver. It's no more the case in, like in, in the past because students are even more uh, prone to use uh, online facilities than old, old guys like us. So, so this is what I, I most time uh, tell people. These two aspects, is especially the environmental issue, the study, the, the conducive and research, uh, study and uh, research environment is for me a very important issue for for African university who want to who want to have have the, have the title of Africa Center of Excellence and, and so on. You we, one has to have a clean environment. This is the simple things to do, but people don't do. We had I want to just give one example when I went to. Uh, Last year, that was in, in, in Ethiopia, and a very big university in, in Jima State University. Just they just constructed a new building, um, and we went for the evaluation. And I just asked the director of that uh, building that I want to ease myself. So he, and so he took me to the where the toilets are, and the male toilet was closed, was abandoned, closed. So he succeeded to get the key of the female toilet. I went in, the toilet basin was broken. I just made a picture, I came out, I showed him, I said, but you, when you, you men, if you want to ease yourself, the, okay, the, the male toilet is, has been abandoned, has been closed, so you can go to the bush and do whatever. But how do the female do? The female toilet, okay, one can open and go inside, but 
a female cannot sit on it, it's broken. Uh, uh, so he was starting scr scratching his head. So, oh, actually we have uh, things to replace. But I said, why did you not, did you not do it? And because of that, we, we rejected the application. Just of that, it's not because they, they could, they have good scientists there, but it was an international program where international students were to come from different parts of Africa using a, a program called Passer Receive. Then we say, we, we cannot, uh, 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 Accord you such a, uh, a position of an uh, African hosting, host university just because of such things. But I'm just talking to those of you who are lecturers in Africa and who are at, at African University, please you, uh, relay this message to your vice chancellors and so on that it is important to, 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 to create an, a conducive research environment for students. Um, now I've come to uh, energy context in Africa. And most of the slides that I'm showing are not, I'm not the one who produced the, the slide. I took it, that's why I've, 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 I've given the names of the guys. Daniel Yamegwe is of this year in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, is our member, and so member. And yeah, then Professor Yao Azuma is now an entrepreneur in solar energy in uh, Burkina Faso and in Togo, where okay, he was a lecturer of uh, this year, then he went to Powers. But then some geopolitics played the role, so, so he had to quit. And very intelligent uh, a young man, very young, very, very intelligent. So he had to create his company. So he's, uh, he's uh, offering solar services in Burkina Faso and in Togo. And one of our, our scholarship students who finished with, uh, yeah, at uh, this year is working with him as one, he's the director of his, his um, of the company in um, in Togo, so um, the electricity generation gap between Africa and other regions of the world is wide. So the as um, and the situation is critical in sub-Saharan Africa, um, excluding South Africa and North Africa. Consumption average is. Yeah, given this number, one around uh, 1,600 kilo, uh, kilowatt hour per capita per year in Africa, this is insignificant compared to a global average of 7,000 kilowatt uh, hour per capita per year. So we have uh, low, we have two things, low generation and low consumption in general, globally uh, uh, in, in comparison. And when we have to compare a uh, rural and to urban, this slide gives you the, 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 uh, the numbers. The general electrification rate uh, in, in Africa uh, is around uh, 45 percent. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's uh, around 35. That, those were the values of 2014. By now, it has increased a bit, but it's not too much. And then, um, um, in general, when it goes to rural elect electrification, you have to, uh, the average whole of Africa is 28%, but sub-Saharan Africa is around 19%. Now it, it must have gone up to, let me say above 20, maybe 22 or 23, but uh, yeah, um, it is still low. So most of the rural area uh, in Africa are still on, 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 are not uh, elect electrified. So this is a big, a big issue. And even in the, the urban area for those who are, traveling uh, in Africa, when you go to Nigeria and all the big cities, there's constant electricity cut. I just spoke with somebody today from Cameroon, uh, electricity cut in Douala. So, so you have constant uh, problem with uh, energy problem. And this is also an issue for us to do good research and development. I, as a chemist, for, for, for instance, if I'm doing a reaction uh, in the lab and the time is 24 hours, there are some specific condition. The temperature should be kept at this temperature, at this level, and so on. And if the light goes off, then everything is damaged. And this is also this lack of uh, um, of uh, constant uh, electrical energy is a big problem for all for research. Even if we put in money in research, we have to uh, solve the energy problem. Uh, yeah, this is a, a big issue to, to also to address. Uh, May I ask a question? Yeah. 
uh, yeah, uh, how does it come that it is a it is such a such a big problem? For example, for um, a big uh, country like Nigeria, who has uh, oil, so with oil you can you can uh, you can produce a lot of electricity. Okay, Mr. with oil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I, what is happening in Nigeria is. Um, Nigeria is an extremely corrupt country. Nigeria will have solved its problem for a long time ago. It's just that uh, some politicians are investing, they have market in generators. So in Nigeria, when you come to Nigeria, I went there for the first time last year. I landed in Abuja. I took a hotel and that was in the night. It started raining, the light went off. So they, they started up the generator. So you could not sleep, it was making noise the whole night. So, and that's how, that's the situation uh, in Nigeria. So I, in, during my visit, I went to the, I traveled to Mina. This is the Niger state of, uh, of Nigeria. I, I visited the University of Mina, Federal University of Technology, Mina. In front of the Dean of the Faculty of, uh, uh, of the department, uh, no, the, the head of the department of physics, there was a generator. <laughs> so I, my 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 host took me to to to, to him, uh, so that I could greet him, uh, but we could not really speak because the noise. And uh, but then I asked them that, but you are you, are, you call yourself a University of Federal University of Technology. Why can't you think of using photovoltaics? You have enough uh, solar radiation here and so on. And and that's how we uh, they decided to take me to the, the VC. I met the, the vice chancellor. And we've just signed an MOU that uh, which at long term and so should help in what two things uh, training of technicians and creation of uh, laboratory for research in, 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 in at, the, at that university and at the long 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 term is that the train technicians will be offering services. Uh, not only to the university, but in the city of Mina itself. So this is uh, a concept which we've, we've okay, all of it is on paper, but for that we will need funding. So I'm, I'm trying to get some funding through CO2 compensation. Okay, there's a company here in in, in, in Yemen, in Yena, who contacted who contacted me of recent. Um, they are offering certificate of for CO2 compensation, uh, saying that okay, they contact German companies. If you finance a, a project, whether it's in Germany or abroad, and uh, you can economize or you can endemize your CO2 emission. Yeah, so this is the idea behind it. So they asked me to, say, to submit a project. I submit this project of this University of MENA that uh, would like to do training and uh, biomaterials for training. And, and so on. And uh, then I submitted another project in Kigali, but I ended, decided to take the project in Kigali. So the project in Kigali will be financed, but it's also the same concept where the project in Kigali is concerns um, the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church in Kigali, they are building a new cathedral and they have a guest house, a school, a nursing school, a primary school. And so we will uh, install solar panels that will ca carry out training uh, within for three years, where we'll be training pastors and normal uh, churchgoers. The idea that these pastors will bring the concept of photovoltaic concept in their various Paris uh, dioceses in within uh, uh, Rwanda. So this is the, the, the thing. Uh, so at least that one, it will amount around 80,000 euro. That company says they were going to look for funding for that. So, but I'm still looking for other funding for some different universities. Uh, just as what um, our friend from uh, Senegal, the concept which he is bringing that uh, making universities um, uh, a role model when it comes to uh, not only training but propagation of photovoltaics. So this is what uh, we, we are um, now uh, doing, looking for more funding. I said I've got one for funding from, from for, for Kigali, for Rwanda, but looking for other funding. Mm -hmm. So on, on this slide, you, you can see um, 
In the case of ECOWAS, uh, that means the West African region, um, how the electrification rate, uh, the national, the urban, and the rural. So you find some cases, um, it is almost like Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Guinea. Uh, rural is just 1% or 1.5% in the case of Indonesia. The country which, which is highly electrified in that region is uh, Cabo Verde. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's still a lot to be done. So if you just go through this chart, you'll find that there's a lot, a lot to be done in rural Africa, in rural sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so when, uh, if one has good uh, business concept uh, to provide uh, standalone system, uh, like standalone photovoltaic system at uh, affordable prices, um, you have a big market because the demand of energy is there. Everybody uses cell phone nowadays. There's no person who also, the, I showed the picture of Maasai using flexible organic solar cell to show, to charge your cell phone. So the demand of energy is very high in Africa. And in the urban area, people, uh, the, the, you have an increase, an increase of the middle class. Uh, demanding more and more energy. But one aspect which Africans have to inculcate is also this aspect of energy efficiency, which has been advanced in, in Europe, but which is not, no, yeah, which is uh, still at its infancy in most African countries. That when I'm building a house, I have to think about the, the energy efficiency aspect of, of, of everything. Yeah. Those are things that we have to also uh, uh, propagate and, and, and teach in, 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 in Africa. Yeah, a special sub Saharan Africa. And uh, the other, uh, I want to say that the ECOWAS region is well organized. They have a lot of um, institutions to promote renewable energy. Um, and, uh, and the same thing, the SADC, the Southern Africa, they are also well there's a well-organized, well yeah. And in Southern Africa, you, you have countries like Mauritius who are 100% electrified, okay? They are just like uh, North Africa, okay? Mauritius, uh, Seychelles, the islands, they are well. So there, uh, the situation is far better than uh, some part of West Africa or Central Africa, a country like uh, uh, Central African Republic, uh, it is, even the, the Bangui, the capital city, is very poorly, I can say less than, the city itself, less than 50% electrified uh, as a capital. So, and the rural area, almost nothing. So, so this, this is a situation which you found in, in Africa. But the demand is there and very high. Um, so when we, we come to um, uh, renewable energy, Renewable energy is, we can see as a solution of all this problem that we're saying. Okay. And uh, in relationship to the SDGs, the, the, the SDG number seven, uh, affordable, and clean, uh, affordable and clean energy, um, it interacts with all, with most of the other SDGs. So there's a nexus with uh, education or, or uh, uh, fight uh, against poverty and, and so on. So, industrialization and, and, and so uh, SDG number seven is very, very important uh, to implement all the other SDGs, most of the SDGs, uh, demand energy. And in, the, in our case, we need to use uh, clean energy. So renewable energy should be at the focus. Uh, when it comes to uh, the renewables, uh, Africa is well blessed in in resources in general. This is presently the richest continent, uh, and that's why we have problems. We are too rich, and, and, and the West want that riches. They, do, they are doing everything to, to create problems in countries like Congo, and then the latest news that I got, they are planning to divide Congo in four, Democratic Republic of Congo. The, there are plans to divide the country in four, different countries, just as what happened in, in Sudan, uh, yeah. And I, I have the, the feeling they want to do the same with Cameroon, where uh, suddenly the Anglophone problem comes in, 
Um, though, yeah, actually, uh, we are using the colonial pass in a case, the case of Cameroon, I'm from Cameroon, to divide ourselves. Uh, the French speaking tribes or the French speaking people and the English speaking, they're, they're interrelated, they're cousins. But this linguistic barrier from which came from the colonial uh, domination uh, is dividing us. But what is behind is the economics. It's, yeah. Cameroon has been, it is said, Cameroon is now one of, even if not the richest country in uh, resources. A, a lot has not been exploited. We have almost all the minerals that you find in Africa. Okay, Af Cameroon is known as Africa in miniature when it comes to the climate and, and, and the, the landscape and so on, and also the people, the different languages and the colonial past. But also when it comes to resources, they've discovered a lot. And that's why suddenly the Anglophone problem start, the Boko Haram problem in the north, and the east, uh, the um, rebels in the, the eastern part of Cameroon. So we have three head of, of, of conflict within a Cam Cameroon country which was peaceful. So, but it's economics behind. Some people want to get that resources. Yeah, this is the, 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 the problem of Africa. The, the richer you are, the cursed you are. When you are not rich, they leave you in peace. So that's the problem with Africa. Yeah. So, and um, yeah, geothermal energy is found mostly in, in, in East Africa. So you, you have some geothermal plants in, in Kenya, um, yeah, which have been exploited. But most in the many countries like Ethiopia, when, when those who have visited Ethiopia, you, you, there are some places where you just go and bathe. Uh, you bathe uh, in warm water coming from, from the earth. They have a lot of uh, geothermal sources there, but yet it has not been really exploited to, to, to gain energy. So, but, so the potential is there in, when it comes to geothermal, the geothermal energy, as I said, in, in Eastern, uh, East and, and partly Central Africa. Geothermal means uh, water? Yeah, it's uh, energy coming from, no, no, geothermal comes from, it's hot water coming from, from the air, from- Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Deep, okay. yeah hot, very, very hot, mm -hmm. so. So you have then the biomass. The biomass is, uh, okay, uh, most, most of the, the country around the equator and southern, south of the equator uh, uh, yeah, are very rich in, 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 in biomass. And I can say in the rural area, um, the energy, it is the main energy source when it comes to cooking. Almost 80% uh, of the in rural Africa, even in the cities, many people are using biomass uh, uh, as a source of energy. And I've, in the case of Zambia, there's some uh, the lady from Zambia. I know what I got a, a report that um, in Zambia, um, every year, the surface of Zaland, Zaland is one of the smallest states in Germany, is deforested because of um, people looking for wood for charcoal. But it is not, the, the, there's, there's no reforestation taking place. And this is something you find in most of East African countries. I've visited Kenya, uh, Tanzania. People are using charcoal for, for, for cooking. And they cut the wood, but they don't replace it, which is a big uh, issue. And I think 2018, when I was, I was uh, in Kenya for an evaluation, the topic came on TV that through the, the high, uh, highly use of, of wood, uh, there is um, land erosion. So when it rains, the, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's causing much damage for, on the fertile soil and, and so on. And they were saying they should reduce the wood consumption or look for an alternative or do reforestation. If you are using, you have to, when you cut, you have to plant it again. So, but people don't have that reflex of replanting, and which is, uh, uh, but we are proposing, I can hear in this letter, I said, uh, rapid deforestation due to need for cooking wood and cooking charcoal. And we said, I'm saying solar cookers plus fireless cookers and wood saving stoves can slow down deforestation. So a combination of solar cookers, um, I'm going to show you what, what are there. And 
uh, fireless cookers and wood saving stoves can be uh, uh, plus wood can be a solution to slow down uh, deforestation in, in, in many African countries where uh, people are accustomed of using uh, wood for, for cooking or charcoal for cooking. <coughs> and reforestation is a must. We have to replan. So we, we put biomass as renewable energy. It's, biomass is only is a renewable energy only when you replace what you've cut down. It's no more renewable if you just cut down and, and don't replace. So it's only renewable when you take this effort of replanting. So when these are this is an example of a solar cooker. I was I had the privilege to attend one for, for, after Ansol was created. I was invited to attend a solar cooker international conference in Altötting in uh, Bavaria in Germany, and yeah, and then you have this S, S key, this uh, parabolic solar cooker, and you know the principle of uh, solar cooker. Okay, uh, there is. Um, uh, Accumulation of, of light, uh, uh, okay. Solar rays uh, go on the aluminium, and they are focused on the accumulator and focused on the black pot, and so so you can cook soup. You can do a lot of things. Uh, yeah. But the problem has been uh, the acceptance of solar cooker in Africa, uh, especially in the in the nineties. Some NGOs started to promote solar cookers in West Africa. Like countries like Burkina Faso, Senegal, where there's a lot of sun, and uh, yeah, but people did not accept this technology because they said cooking with wood, the food has another taste. Okay, in the <laughs> when you cook some food with wood, the smell of the the wood goes into the food, or uh, the smoke uh, is like an aroma. So so said if I cook with 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 uh, wood. It, it tastes better because that has been a tradition over centuries than when I use solar cooker. It, it tastes uh, funny. But um, I said, if one, one has to change the mentality, we have to start changing from kindergarten. One has to go to schools, even in, in, in nursery school, and use, show the children what the, the, the importance, uh, advantages of using such solar cookers. And I think with time, then you'll get to the to to change the mentality and, and making people using in mass. And I'll show examples where such a, such thing has been done in, in like in Madagascar. So here you have this slide showing you the different temperature that you can use to 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 cook different food and and, and using solar solar cooker. And this is what we call the the fire fireless cookers. Means you you can in the case where uh, the sun doesn't shine or the sun shines very odd, in the case where uh, in, in the village when the husband, somebody comes from the, the farm or the, husband, the, the men came, come very late in the evening and they want to have warm food. So a combination of solar cooker and fireless cooker can help. So because you cook something like rice, just 10 minutes in, and then you put it in this fireless cooker, which is something which keep preserve it, it preserve it. So the thing can continue to be cooking in this uh, basket uh, that you see here, and yeah, and uh, then even late in the night. So, so, so this is the advantage of such a combination. And there are some NGOs in Kenya producing such uh, basket, just uh, uh, fireless uh, cookers. So you have a black uh, cloth and, and uh, within, and yeah. So um, we have this international conference on solar cooker is. Uh, is is held every um, every two years in Germany, but also now in Portugal, then in the U.S., in India. There are some groups now worldwide, a group of people who, who are very uh, uh, solar cooker themed, so they do everything in solar cooker. Like this guy is from Portugal, uh, so he's um, he's a passionate solar cooker. So and uh, he cooks at his home only with solar cooker in in Portugal. So, uh, and you have the different forms of uh, shift of solar cooker. And what uh, one NGO called ADES in, uh, did in uh, Madagascar was to train, to take young women, they, they decided to train women <coughs> um, on how to build solar cookers and to use them. 
and they created 11 training centers within the whole country and trained more than 100 uh, people, 100,000 people uh, uh, in, in, the, the, in, in the country with, uh, with, 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 uh, with time. And, and now many people are using solar cooker in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Madagascar in combination with this uh, 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 wood saving stove. Yeah. So we um, have got the opportunity within ASO to, to come to Trieste, that was 2014, and present solar cooker to children. They loved it. And this is something that I'm saying for, for, for you to bring such new technology, you have to convince children, go to schools or, and yeah. So we, we um, uh, here you see on the, on the, the left hand side on top, these children, we prepared cake with solar cooker, we cook eggs and they, they were so happy to, to eat those, to eat the eggs and so on. Because it was uh, interest at the city center, it's really, really when it's sunny, you have a, a high radiation and, and we just within, within 10 minutes is boiling already. So it's a very fast process if the sun is, uh, when, when, if the radiation is high. So, so we, we, yeah, uh, just so again, the, the, we've, we've been in too many uh, other places using, presenting solar cookers. So uh, here, this slide just gives you the advantages this is from so-called the um, Solar Cooker International. There's an, an organization, Solar Cooker International, which, which is promoting solar cookers. Uh, and here they are saying, in time of crisis, like global crisis, like this COVID-19, so, solar cooker are the, the uh, advantageous to use when people are, are at home, don't have to move, to look for wood. Uh, so uh, using solar cookers, uh, is uh, of great advantage. So I'm not going to read down all. So you, if you want to know more, you can just read down all the what they the, the, the provide as advantages of using solar cookers. Um, especially in refugee refugee camps now during the COVID-19 uh, period, using of the use of solar cookers is of great advantage. So when we come to to, to other energy sources like the wind energy. Wind energy is mostly developed in North, uh, North, North Africa, uh, the, the coastal area, um, and uh, yeah, South Africa, Southern Africa also, and yeah, then the islands like Cabo Verde, where you, you, you can see, that this is the case of, of ECOWAS region. Uh, Cabo Verde has a very high uh, percentage of, uh, of uh, uh, wind uh, as compared to Ga Gambia or Nigeria, for instance. Um, so Cabo, Cabo Verde produces 26 megawatt, Nigeria 0 0.03, for instance. Uh, uh, the hydropower, many African countries are using hydro, especially countries where you have rivers. Cameroon, our main energy source is hydro, and uh, the same with Nigeria and uh, most uh, West African countries and, and others, yeah, are using hydropower. But that is not enough. And those hydropower are grid uh, system. You have very few micro hydro where you, uh, yeah. Uh, so that this, um, the, the grid, I said the, most of the, the grids in West Africa or Central Africa are based on hydropower. And um, uh, that is why, um, but this, this grid goes only to the, the big cities. So the rural area, uh, is uh, has uh, energy deficiency, deficiency. So that's why photovoltaics, other uh, form of uh, renewable energy should play a role there, especially photovoltaics. So uh, standalone systems or, uh, can play a role. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this slide gives you also uh, some uh, information on hydropower in, uh, in ECOWAS region, West, uh, West African region. Yeah. Mm. So coming to solar, to solar, Africa is blessed with uh, solar energy. But I want to say um, most of the other renewable energy, uh, the type of renewable energies like, uh, let me say, uh, wind energy, biomass, um, ocean tide, are related with the sun. The sun has, and if, as 
uh, biomass without uh, uh, solar energy, there is no, uh, okay, there's no biomass. So, so for photosynthesis to take place, you need, uh, you need the light. So, so indirectly, almost all the renewable energy are solar, okay, if we have to put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, when it comes to solar, we can see the, 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 the map, this is a world map of uh, solar radiation. So Africa is very much blessed and, and, and yeah, when it comes to uh, uh, high uh, irradiation. Uh, um, solar in a 74 percent of the continent receive more than 1,900 kilowatt per square meter per year. So uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, for you to implement solar energy um, in, in Africa, one has to take many things into consideration to account the environmental and climatic conditions, uh, high temperatures. Sometimes high temperature is not good, very high temperature are not good for some specific imported photovoltaic panels in, in Africa. So high temperature leads to drop uh, or uh, decreases the efficiency in general. Okay, we have um, sometimes uh, long raining seasons, dust, etc. cetera, societal uh, behaviors. This societal behaviors means you can put your solar panels on your roof, somebody comes and, and steal it. Yeah, so, yeah, and also the purchasing power. And what, what I want to mention is this aspect of dust. I was in, in, uh, in Arusha, Tanzania. It is a wonderful country where you can uh, install panels, but the dust is so, there are a lot of dust when cars are passing. So your solar panel, if you put it close to the, your house is close to the road, because the roads are not tired, just within few minutes, the solar panel is covered with dust and so the efficiency drops dramatically. So that's a big issue. So Africa is blessed with the sun, but we have to take into consideration all these other aspects which are hindering the, the good implementation of uh, photovoltaics in, 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 in Africa. Yeah. Uh, like there are some young uh, people, young guys, uh, who decided to, to um, design uh, an adaptable solar, solar panel uh, to the uh, corrugated roof. Uh, this is a project uh, between some uh, young guys from, from Switzerland, some Swiss, and, and from Kenya. And so it was, it's a solar panel which is easily to be transported, you can buy it, and, and, and it's already been made in such a way that it's, uh, it's, it's take the waves of the corrugated roof, so you just go and nail it, so that somebody cannot steal it. <laughs> but that's, yeah. So it's just part, it's part well uh, integrated in your, in your roof. So this is just an example of uh, adaptable technology for, for within Africa. Uh, I am, uh, Africa is so blessed with the sun that uh, one can transfer the ideas which are happening in Europe, uh, uh, business-wise, to Africa. In Germany, uh, there's the, since the last, let me say the last, uh, almost more than 10 years now, that they introduced what they call solar beer, or solar, a solar, not solar beer and solar things. Yeah. I mean, solar beer, Using when you use photovoltaics or renewable energy like wood or uh, hydropower for your energy source while brewing, and you you get a label. This is a certification uh, from the, the Technical University of, of, of Munich, working together with uh, some companies. There's, they give you this, this certificate, um, so and you can place it on your beer. So it, it has become a boom, especially small breweries in Germany are trying to go solar and to get this brand. And people like it, those who are environmental friendly would prefer to buy such solar beer. Why can't we do it in Africa? This is the question. So for instance, such, uh, such a solar beer, um, the production of such a solar beer that you see here, 33 uh, centiliter, the production causes only two grams of CO2, but con conventional, uh, energy form will produce uh, 73 gram of CO2 while producing. Uh, so you have a reduction of more than 90%, 98% uh, 
less uh, uh, um, uh, yeah uh, environmental um, hazard hazard yeah uh, when you use uh, this uh, when using uh, photovoltaics or or biomass or yeah while producing this type of beer. So and um, in Germany they they have made now solar food label so solar bread solar this thing solar solar anything using uh, yeah renewable energy. So these ideas can be also done in Africa. If somebody starts in Zambia, like my sister in Zambia, if you want to start a business, say I'm producing. Uh, in that case, we'll, we'll say, okay, uh, we can, because there's no labeling, there's no labeling agency in, in Africa. We have to think, uh, Pharaohs uh, and Ketedi, we have to think of creating such a thing, a certification. Yeah, that we, 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 we jeopardize the <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, they, they will say, yeah. This is something which people can do because people are doing it here and making money, huh? mm -hmm. and they are, are working. The, the also it has um, a capacity building effect. You are educating the people to think uh, environmental friendly. Say okay. Yes, it's this not a bad idea, Daniel, because if you make money with uh, advertising things like that, you can mm -hmm. put that money on research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something which we have to think. I said there's no, no um, labeling or no certification agency of solar food or anything in Africa. So actually, this guy who started, they contacted me. They wanted me to help to represent them in Africa. And in 2018, we exported for the first time such solar beer to South Africa. Okay, mm -hmm. I contacted the company. The first company who started the solar beer thing is uh, near Nuremberg uh, and so we exported one container full of solar beer but the lady who bought the beer she was not so uh, okay she was not a good businesswoman so she did not do market survey before importing so the, the container arrived at Durban as a seaport and got stuck there because she could not find people buying so normally you need to make advertisement beforehand and just come and supply but she so after that, just one that one thing, after that one uh, export, we stopped about the, the whole thing. But it's an idea, one can do it at home. there. You, you do use, uh, I said most time, just small breweries, not big breweries, where, mm -hmm. yeah. But this is a good, a good idea for, for, for many, many countries in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, to start such a thing with a combination of, um, of, of because they are using wood pellet. Mm -hmm. The company who have visited it, they are using wood pellet to create heat for, for cooking, to boiling water and, and, and so on. And they are using photovoltaic for electricity, for their roof, for all their electricity, this thing. So the combination of biomass and photovoltaic. There are other companies in Germany who use micro, um, um, micro hydropower, yeah, to generate electricity. So all those things can uh, have a level. So it is for us to, to start, I don't know, I don't know if some, some government will accept, but we, we can say we are starting such a level. We'll give you condition and then... And, so and, Daniel, uh, let's, let's think about that. Let's uh, discuss it more. Yeah, let's discuss it more, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. I think it, yeah. will be, it certainly yeah. has the potential. Yeah, and uh, I think it will awaken the awareness about renewables if you, mm -hmm. you bring such a thing. And people will buy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I brought the beer many times. I always go when I travel, I bring such solar beer as a gift. People like it. They ask, where can I buy it? <laughs> yeah. So so this is a, an, a business concept. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, also these are, when it comes to um, renewables, uh, when it comes to solar energy, the most prominent is uh, photovol uh, photovoltaics, <coughs> but we have also the, the thermal aspect, uh, concentrated solar uh, power using a solar heat heating system or a solar heat to uh, uh, generate electricity, indirectly generate electricity by boiling something and which uh, turns a turbine to generate electricity. So this CSP, the CSP technology is uh, not, okay, is mostly developed in Southern Africa. South Africa has uh, CSP plants and in, in, in North Africa. Now, in um, uh, Morocco is, is the country with 
uh, with large uh, CSP plant. We have no one, no two, no three. Um, and um, producing electricity, actually, the, the, in, in, in North Africa, there was a project around 2012, Desert Tech project. At 2000, uh, it started at the IJX, was uh, uh, the guy who brought that, brought up the idea was a German guy, but he, he passed away around four or five years ago. Um, uh, to um, get energy from North Africa for Europe, to supply uh, Europe is, uh, with uh, energy from the desert by using the CSP technology. But it was too, uh, for me, imperialistic. And uh, I attended one just after the creation of Ansar. We, I was invited to, to give a lecture at one big meeting uh, organized by that. The, the, the organized by the desertic guys in Hamburg, and they are so, Daniel, what is the what is CSP? I, I'm not sure. Cons I, I... Concentrated solar power. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you, if you type uh, N O O R, you can see nor one, nor two, nor three. Uh, yeah. A very big complex in in Morocco. In Morocco. Uh, it was based on this technology uh, yeah. by uh, Desert Tech at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then Morocco is now uh, free of this Desert Tech. Uh, yeah, because the that. Desert Tech, yeah. yeah, and the Desert Tech things fail. Mm. Why? Because the big German companies decided to to back up uh, Bosch, Siemens. Ooh, yes. ooh, ooh, yeah, because it's uh, not economically viable and yeah. it's uh, ecologically uh, uh, a disaster. A disaster. Ecologically is a really a disaster. So I, I, I read I read that Algeria is uh, has uh, signed an MOU with Desert Tech. Uh, yeah, they, they want to restart again. months ago. Yeah. yeah, they want to restart again. Although the thing died, now they are trying to. Exactly. To, it's to it's really again. a dangerous project. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, uh, you were selling only Morocco, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, there is also a big complex uh, in uh, Senegal. Joseph is, is, uh, is connected, I think, and we can confirm. Um, yeah. On, on CSP, CSP com uh, Maybe not based on CSP. Yeah, no, no, I don't so think. Uh, you, they don't, don't have, uh, in, in West no. Africa, we don't have, we don't yet have any CSP big complex. You have some research, uh, small research that's like this year, has a small CSP uh, thing that they build themselves for, for research, but big complexes we don't yet have in, uh, in West Africa, although one can also do it there. I know that the big complex are in North Africa and Southern Africa, South Africa. For the, for, for the moment, for the moment, yeah. So uh, in, in, in West Africa, you have big uh, photovoltaic plants like this. Uh, uh, the bigger, the largest one now is this uh, Zaktuli solar plant in uh, Burkina Faso, which was inaugurated 2016. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, yes, you're right. And then in Senegal. Uh, and you have, you have such solar plants also in Senegal. Yes, uh, in Marina. Yes, Marina. Yeah. yeah. So uh, such solar fields now you have, uh, Ghana has, uh, Senegal has, uh, Burkina Faso has, yeah. So you have those things now in, in but the largest is this one, this uh, Zatuli uh, solar plant. And I said the big problem also there is dust. We, I visited this plant 2008, no, 2019, when we, we I was invited by the Minister of Energy for CERA, uh, Semen uh, des Energies Renewables de l'Afrique, uh, and we, we had the opportunity to visit. So they waste a lot of water washing. So there's a, <laughs> there's a, um, a guy on a tractor moving up, uh, cleaning the, the, this thing almost every hour. Ago. So there's, you waste a lot of energy to maintain the, these things. Uh, that's a big issue. So yes, one has to think of, one has to think of um, dust repelling coating and there are people working on it that the coating on the, uh, this thing should be dust repellent so that the dust, when it comes, it can just go down itself. And, and uh, these are, these are uh, research ideas for, to implement, as I said, to implement uh, solar energy in, in Africa, this aspect of dust should be solved, uh, the problem of dust. I think there are some small, com not company, but uh, I saw last year uh, at, uh, at CERN, uh, 
uh, young people coming presenting a project which is uh, cleaning self cleaning yeah this, uh, yes this thing a very interesting thing so so if you know those should, people should. let let because those are uh, are really practical yeah except for Africa because those mm -hmm. are things where Africa need uh, we need uh, panels which are uh, dust repelling with self cleaning uh, have self cleaning surface if not it's uh, it's a big issue. You will say Africa is blessed with the sun, but how can I really implement it well? So, and that's why people are saying a country like Britain, although it has low solar radiation, but it's very effective because it rains permanently, not heavy rain like, yeah, but it rains. So it, it constantly clean, the, the, the solar panels are constantly clean uh, because of the, the constant rain. And, but in countries like Burkina Faso, which is a dry land, there's a lot of dust and they have rains are, are scared. So you have to waste a lot of water. That's, this uh, is a, is a truly uh, plan. As I said, there's, there's a guy having a, a machine cleaning constantly, going up and down cleaning. So it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, wasted. I can say you waste a lot of energy to maintain such a plant. Mm. <clears throat> Okay, then uh, the CSP, uh, an example of a CSP plant in, in South Africa. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, when it comes to, uh, yeah, this slide just gives you uh, uh, the key element of an ecosystem for a sustainable renewable energy deployment. So you have, uh, it's just like a chain. Um, so you have the technology, you have the policies and the regulation, capacity building, institutional framework business and, and financing model. This slide, I said, these slides are not from me. This is from uh, Daniel Yamagui from this, this year. This, uh, and this year is the head of department of, uh, of solar energy there. So that's what he's teaching every day. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, policies, and uh, those are the different steps from political announcement, um, energy strategy, detailed roadmap to legally binding uh, renewable energy targets. So uh, those are things that uh, one has to go through to do a real implementation of uh, renewables in, 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 in Africa. In Africa, we have um, so-called, we have five uh, power poles, energy poles, okay. One in North, uh, North Africa, uh, Western Africa, North Africa, Eastern Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa power pool. When it comes to the uh, re, uh, um, policies or uh, regulatory policy, uh, regulatory system, um, it is well developed in, okay, they have achieved when it comes percentage wise, uh, North Africa is the highest where a lot has been done, more has been done, but not fully because it's just 23% of the implementation. I removed a lot of slides from, I just took some of the slides because I don't want to, uh, uh, before he got to this slide, he showed all, some details, I, but I just I could not want to go through all those details. So, but if, if people need some of his slides, I have slides from different, different lectures that are collected from different people uh, who are attending my conferences. So I can, I can supply you many slides if you want to do anything on renewable energy, but so long as you cite the person, that's fine. So, um, so I have a lot of uh, lectures on different things on, on renewable energy. So, but you can see uh, the Central African uh, uh, power pool is extremely low. There's no um, interaction among the, the, the governments to do certain things in the regional at the regional level. But the West Africans are very well organized, to say the truth. Uh, among the sub-Saharan African uh, countries. The West African and the, and the Southern Africans are well organized. The North Africans, I said, is another world. They are, they are far better, but still, as compared to Europe, they, still, they are still lagging. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, the same as when it comes to fiscal incentive. So the fiscal incentive for, for you to go uh, solar or to go renewable is highest in, in West Africa, uh, then second by uh, South Africa and, and so on. Uh, when it comes to capacity building for, for um, um, especially at the higher high education level, there are some programs trying to train PhDs and, and masters in, in renewable energy. 
And I just cite some of, some of them here. And I want to say that uh, at the lower level, the level of technicians, there's still much to be done. We have um, very few vocational colleges doing good training on photovoltaics or installation of photovoltaics and, and so on. And, and some people, like nowadays when, you, when you, you are in Senegal or in Burkina Faso or in Cameroon, you, you people's Chinese are selling uh, cheap photovoltaics on the street. People are buying. But uh, an electrician, and somebody who, have, <laughs> who, who, who calls himself an electrician, cannot autom automatically install solar panels or maintain solar panels well if you've not got a specific training. And this is, and sometimes people just do it and everything goes bad or sometimes uh, uh, your, your roof uh, the, uh, gets um, uh, the thing or in some cases the, the roof cannot uh, carry the whole thing and so your roof collapses and so on. So there are a lot of issues uh, to, to be taken into account. And so for that, you need uh, trained personnel. And um, that's why we, our concept, the concept that which uh, that we want to do, that I think that's what also our friends in, in Senegal want to do at, uh, if within the university to do training, not only uh, of students, but also technician, people from any person who said, I want to be trained as a, uh, uh, a installator of uh, photovoltaics can be trained and have a really thorough training and, um, uh, yeah, uh, so that we should have highly skilled uh, tr uh, installers, uh, installators of, uh, uh, of photovoltaics in, in, in Africa. This is, as I said, this is a big lack and something should be done um, even at the university level. So, mm -hmm. um, we have for, at the higher education level, there are a series of programs uh, who are, uh, which are, providing funding to train yeah, PhDs and masters in, in this yeah, in renewable energy. Like the Passive Receive Program, I'm going to present it, and the World Bank African Center of Excellence, uh, the MCESA network, which is in Eastern and Southern Africa, our network ourselves, uh, I'm not going to talk about it because I've spoken already about it. They will have the Nelson Mandela Universities, the Pan-African Universities, and various EU-funded programs. So this Parcel Receive program uh, um, is Parcel means Partnership for Skill in Applied Sciences, Engineering and Technology. And it has um, a, a regional scholarship and innovation fund, which is there to, to, to fund uh, PhDs and yeah, in five thematic area. This, this program is coordinated by the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, which is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I visited it this year, the beginning of this year, and I, I made these pictures. And they, they are energy out out. So they've, they've uh, um, installed solar panels all over the place. So they're, they're self-sufficient in energy through all their roof is uh, with solar. So they don't need to, okay, uh, yeah. Which I this is something which I, I will I I will recommend to many African universities actually because I visited the, I was there because I had to make I had to organize a conference at the Technical University of of of, of Nairobi and <laughs> you will not find any single panel somewhere and <laughs> I told them see uh, this I, ICP 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 the, that's how they call it they have their their energy sufficient to uh, photovoltaics why can't you people do the same you you have uh, you are a technical university, and uh, you will save a lot of, uh, of, of, of money by installing uh, photovoltaics. Uh, so this Passive Receive uh, program is funded by five African countries, Senegal, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, and Kenya. Um, they are looking for other countries to come in uh, yeah, uh, and put in money to fund uh, five thematic area uh, for, for, yeah, in PhD uh, training. So, and um, part of the funding comes also from the, the, the World Bank and from uh, South Korea. So, 
Um, these are the main issues concerning this program, what they are uh, uh, gearing to, bill capacity, uh, the bill of capacity of core uh, African host university uh, to establish international quality PhD training, research and innovation for the benefit of the region, develop partnership and network between host universities, international and regional research centers, fund doctoral training, and increase participation of women in PhD program. So this in, especially in asset fields. These are the, the five thematic areas where they are, they are training and energy, including renewable energy plays a big role. So uh, also climate change issue. So, and uh, the, the other um, network which I, uh, which funded this, um, uh, which is funded by uh, the Swedish government, and um, this um, this MCESA network called Material Science and Solar Energy Network in Eastern and Southern Africa. I so said this network <clears throat> is funded by uh, SIDA through the University of Uppsala uh, through a program called International Science Pro Program (ISP). And uh, the ISP program is part of ANSOL, so they became an institutional member of ANSOL, and uh, they are supporting us very much. So. And I had the opportunity to do, do evaluation of this network uh, 2017 to 2019. Uh, this network, uh, this MCSA network consists of five universities, uh, two in, 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 in Kenya, Nairobi, uh, Nairobi and Eldoret, the Makere University, Dais Alam, and the University of Zambia. And uh, the, the good idea about this network is that the, the topics and this is the good thing about, I can say, the CEDA funding. The CEDA funding doesn't impose, okay, they give a directive, but they don't impose what you should uh, research on automatically. So you, they just, yeah, you can say, want to do research on renewables, but then they leave you do what you want in that field of renewable, okay. So um, um, the network, they share laboratory equipment, so if, if somebody wants to do EFM measurement, or want to do IR, so uh, lab, Laboratory A has this instrument, uh, instrument A, B, C, and Laboratory B has C, C, D, E, and so on. So we try to exchange. We send our students from A to, to lab, from Laboratory A to Laboratory B or something like that. So that's what they are doing within the network. And they do also training of technician to make, who are maintaining the, the, the laboratory uh, 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 equipment, the lab equipment. So, and do co-supervision of, of students and join proposals and join events. But the, the big problem, which was for me, the weakness of the, the network was the coordination of the network was moving from one place to the other. And because of that, <laughs> They could not, they were not so effective. Nobody took, took it as a responsibility to say, I want to have this network move uh, ahead. Because I discovered, we discovered that they received a lot of money, but at the end of the day, after more than 10 years, they had very little, maybe one or two students who really finished their PhD, and but they were wasting money on board meetings of the, the professors. Those go to Dar es Salaam, rent a hotel, make board meeting, spend 90%, almost half of the money of, of the budget on their meetings. I, I said, but now that with COVID, I think they will have to change things to be doing online uh, board meetings uh, so that the money should be spent on students. So they, they never, students receive very little of the, of the money given to the, the network, which was very bad. So I, then I, I told them, see, compared to Ansel, Okay, I'm doing ANSOL with passion. So we, I, I was receiving uh, per year from uh, ICTP average of 15,000 euro. But I succeeded to, to graduate within four or five years, more than 13 PhDs. But you have been there getting money every year from, from, from CEDA. You are doing absolutely nothing. It's true me, we imposed them to have a website after more than 10 years. It's now that they just created a website just because of the coordination. You should create a network. We need a leader. You need a, a permanent office. You cannot be moving the office from one place to a, a, another. Uh, it, it's totally ineffective. 
People will say, uh, people will call me that Daniel, the fact that you are leading and so on, you are a dictator. But I said, you need some continuity. Without continuity, certain things cannot work well. And this is, and this is what they themselves, some of the professors told me, yeah, the fact that we are moving the office from one place to the other is making us totally ineffective. We need somebody to say, I'm the leader. Um, I take things in my hand. I make things move so that the network should work. So this was a big problem with this network. Uh, that was not effective. They spent a lot of money for nothing. Yeah. Sir, question, uh, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so is the so does CEDA provide funding for the network as a whole, or is it for each university individually? They they, they have two type of funding. They give money for the network as a whole, and then. You can also, within the university, which is part of the network, apply to CEDA for specific things. So they have these two type of funding. Yeah. Yeah. But I said they, they, they used a lot of money for, for, for what I, uh, the money that they've used for the past, for the 10 years worth uh, of evaluation was too much money, but the, um, the yield was too low. Yield That's something low. we need to change about research in Africa. Yeah. So much. I think it's greed, actually. <laughs> it's greed of the professors. It's greed of the professors. You had, you had within the group, this old professor, one old, I don't want to name names, in, uh, at the University of McHenry, very stuck, would, okay, he, he comes from the old school. He, he said, I'm the big professor, you don't approach me. So <laughs> those are guys who are ruling this system and they think of life themselves. Yeah. The money is for me. Uh, not for actually you 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 get money to to train students, but how many students end up having PhD? They were saying they they wanted uh, to increase the gender. How many women were even there in the groups? Almost nothing. So we uh, so we and when I, I got into why I understood the system, I said, but I know many ladies who are looking for PhD position, and you have a group in Kenya. How can you take this this student? And in one case, in in uh, in. <laughs> in um, uh, uh, McHenry. I even sent one student to meet that one professor, said this is a female student looking for PhD in, in Uber and you please. She has got her master in, in Algeria. She speaks, she's, yeah, please take her. But the guy said, no, we don't have and this. But at the same time, they will go to see that and say, oh, uh, there are not much ladies doing physics. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we don't have ladies. Yeah, as a planation. Yeah. So I will just, uh, th those are two examples. I said there are other examples of uh, uh, networks and, 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 and activities to uh, train in, in, in renewable energy in, in Africa. For me, um, this would have been a good example, this MCSA, if their concept was put in place as their plan at the beginning. Because uh, sharing of, because that, uh, the fact that most universities don't have most African, South Saharan African universities don't have a uh, well-equipped lab. If we can share, so I have this and you have the other, we, we complement ourselves. If you do it effectively, that would be a wonderful thing and in a, in a sub-region. Um, and if the, your funding is really used to help students get their PhD on time and so on, then that would be wonderful. This concept is a nice concept, but the implementation, you see the human aspect, a, a greed, egoism, and I don't know what. <laughs> Okay, so I will just um, end up uh, uh, there. Uh, I invite those who do want to join our network and so is open to everybody. And, uh, and I, I think this network is the, when it comes to capacity building in Africa, we, we are the, the, for the moment, for me, I think the biggest network, which bring people from different parts of Africa, where the North Africans are well represented, the Eastern Africans, the Southern Central, uh, everybody feels at home with answer. We don't have much money. We don't have money because people don't pay their, their membership fees. Um, I'm the one trying to, to keep it running, but I think um, it's a network created by Africans for Africans. And we need people to, I need people to support me to make, to make things clear. Uh, it's not only financially, but bringing ideas how we can do things to promote renewable energy in Africa. I am now optimistic for this project, which I'm going to do in um, Kigali with the Anglican Church. I'm happy that 
the German comp uh, this uh, CO2 compensation uh, institution is ready to put, put in money for that. And this is going to be a start. And I, if I have funding to do such um, the same concept in at the University of, uh, of uh, the Federal University of MENA, of Federal University of Technology in MENA, Nigeria, where we can also do training of not only students but technicians from the locality, and then start providing services. We can go from there to entrepreneurship. So uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we are on the, the right track. I will first see what happens with this uh, 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 Kigali's uh, uh, activity, then uh, move forward. But I want to say, with the Technical University of Kenya, together with uh, the University of um, Washington, University of Washington, there's an energy center uh, of the University of Washington. There are two young students there, PhD students who are members of ANSOL, uh, Americans, uh, white Americans, who, uh, uh, who this, they have decided to come, they want to cooperate with, I put, I put them in contact with the University of the Tinka University of, of Kenya, so that they will look for funding to start up a research lab in, at the TUK in Kenya, and at the same time, students, such a way that students from the US will come and interact with students in Africa or in, in, in Kenya, then carry out together, carry out project in communities, rural area. This is the idea behind. And they can also, by doing it, collect data for their PhD and whatever. Those who are working on renewable energy, this is what we are working on now. And the, the concept is what uh, is going on now with the Technical University of Berlin. The concept or the idea is called service learning. Service learning is, um, is a program where students within their uh, bachelor or master courses can go to the community and do a service which is related to their studies. So if you are studying renewable energy, you can go and do it practically and do something in, in a community. And this is credited. It's part of your, 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 the credits that you receive in, in, in your studies. So this is going on uh, now in Berlin, the Technical University of Berlin, together with a series of universities in Africa, in Kenya, the university in, in uh, uh, what, I've forgotten the name in, in Kenya, but not in Nairobi, in Uganda, Be, uh, Benin, um, Burkina Faso, uh, Senegal, and um, DRC. Some universities in these countries uh, are also Cameroon, uh, in cooperation with the Technical University of Berlin to carry out this service learning or civic engagement or community learning. Those are the different names. Uh, very, uh, but these are things that uh, where students do practical uh, things for communities and they receive credit points. Yeah. So the concept what we should want to do between the Washington University of Washington and uh, the, the Technical University of, of, of Kenya goes almost in that line that a laboratory will be created, students from America will come and work together with the students in, in, in Kenya they go to communities and do carry out projects. And the projects will be research also based project. So you can do a project, something good, but at the same time collect data and so on. So these are what we, we are planning in the next near future. Yeah. So I, I, I thank all those who are listening. So if you have questions, you can ask now. Daniel, thanks very much. This uh, was really comprehensive. It's nice to uh, see all of the good work that you are doing and that are going on uh, on the continents, all the challenges that you are facing. Um, it's really unfortunate that uh, there won't, you know, there, there isn't the support that, uh, that we would like to see in, uh, in, the, in, an, in efforts and projects like that. Uh, but I am really pleased to 
to, to hear the talk. This is the first time I've seen, uh, I've listened to your comprehensive talk to this level. Uh, last time in, uh, in uh, uh, Windhoek, because I was managing right, the right, whole right, right, right. Yeah, I, I was all over the place. I couldn't listen to most of the talks myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is really, really nice. Thank you very much. Um, so we did have some uh, discussions uh, along the way. I'm not sure if anybody connected or has other questions or other comments. Um, there was on the chat one comment by uh, Mohamed Saleh from uh, uh, Mauritania. He um, he said that. Uh, uh, let me see. I'm forgetting what he said. I can't see it anymore. He did. He said that there were some solar large solar panels in uh, in Mauritania. Um, Daniel, I'm not sure if you know anything in particular for the case of Mauritania. But I think it's not, it, it, it is normal. You have solar light and solar panel all in almost now almost all over Africa. People are, are putting, but it's not. I will not say that it's uh, it's all over the place. You find it sporadically here and there. And in you, if you if you visit men, I can take the case of Cameroon, where you you visit a city, they've put uh, solar light. But after two, one or two years is bad, and nobody cares. I went to, to Nigeria also in, in the city of Mina. They have uh, solar street light, but it's no more functioning. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I know, have I know. The maintenance in Africa is a, is a huge problem. I, I, you, can, you can see in many countries, uh, I, I go back to Togo, my country, I can see that there was once some very new, up to standard, high level, mm -hmm technical implementation of something either at the university even at the airport and and, yeah, then, that's it. and then you realize that it has just decayed that and then, nobody cares nobody cares and that's what yeah. i was saying when it comes to when it comes to uh, also the universities the toilet this toilet, toilet issue yeah it's uh, you know, a new building within two years the toilets are bad nobody cares right. yeah yeah it's, it's the maintenance is really the maintenance issue is yeah. a big issue it's a big problem right because um yeah we have to that mentality has to change that you know uh, you can you can have a new car but if you don't do service regularly one day we just stop working and you know so everything has to be maintained and, and that culture we need it we need yeah we need to make sure that uh, you know our people in africa really understand that uh, yeah, we uh, can, but the, yeah. The, 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 the problem is in most of the universities in software like let me, if i take cameroon in germany here all the the faculties or the buildings they have what we call house master, the German house master. Yeah. Somebody who is there to see that everything is running. That's and right. If the bulb is bad, they have to replace it. If the toilet, so he is, that's his job. Yes. But in most African universities, nobody, there's no service. Maybe so, some have maintenance service, but it's not so effective. Or this awareness we have to maintain is not there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one of the cult, part of the cultural, uh, you know, uh, understanding that needs to improve uh, mentally. And that's why I say for the new generation. That's why when I, I travel, I try to talk to the new generation, those who are going to be in the next in the next years, uh, dean of the faculty or whoever or uh, vice chancellor. So put that in your mind that I'm a vice chancellor or I'm the leader of this un unit. I have to see this, this hub, that everything is maintained I, or we hire somebody whose job is to see that things are running. Yeah, and, and also this whole idea of stealing things because yeah. you can then put new things there and the next day somebody it's, has it's removed this part, this piece is gone. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, those, are, those are serious problems. Right? It's, it's a cultural think, mentality that we have to improve upon. Otherwise, uh, I think I think what has but if you if one start because people are not talking about it. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. Get me. People yeah. are not sitting and talking about these issues. Because yeah. if you start speaking to students, if from uh, year one you come in a university, they tell you that this 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 this, 
that that's how you use the toilet and that's how and so on people will, will listen and we have to also start training from kindergarten from from your that i said to change the mentality will take it's a long process but if we start giving inculcating the children from 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 childhood they will, it will change but i said for me uh, as a student at and sub is a sub saharan african university especially as a lady it's a big issue it's a big problem yeah, a big yeah. problem no that's uh, yeah yeah no the, those things have to they really have to change okay so i would suggest that we stop uh, for today so i think uh, we should have you back sometime uh, again during the year mm -hmm. uh, i think it would be nice for you to give the uh, you know, a part of the talk of the sensibilization talk and all of your experience, uh, yeah. your experiences, and and uh, you know, um, and uh, and how you see uh, like the changes that we need to implement in in our countries in, in Africa in general. What could be the driving force? Yeah, the, you know, uh, for. For, for 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 education and research, you know that type of talk. Yeah. Um, you know, I will I will uh, I will contact you early so you can yeah. take some time to organize it. So it will yeah. not be necessarily about the the solar and the renewable, yeah. although you can put that uh, in it uh, in a reduced fashion as as what you are doing. But mm -hmm. you know, the this change of mentality, this change, change of, of mentality strategy, is the most important thing. That's right. Yeah, it would be the nice for us to have yeah. seminar from you on that. Yeah, so we'll organize it later uh, mm -hmm. during the year, and I'll be in contact with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, thank you very much, and for me, it has been really an eye opening and uh, to be able to uh, uh, to hear you. Uh, uh, this is really nice. Now, some of the alumni who are con uh, connected, they were asking if you give them authorization to share the slide with other people. Yeah, they can share. I said it's open to share it to whoever. So, okay. Yeah. So I invite them to to join us. So they have our email address and. Uh, yeah. In the slide, let them become a member of Ansol, and uh, Ansol is uh, is an African network, and, and let's let's work together. And yeah. the, as the problem of us African, we are most time jealous instead of supporting each other. Yeah, we that's, are that's, yeah, that's a big problem. Are fighting <laughs> one brother, and this is what issue <laughs> <you> also. <laughs> okay, we have to <laughs> work for work together, and I think what Farus and you, Ketevi, are doing, bringing us together. I appreciate it very much, and uh, let's continue on that that path. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. okay then um, yeah. Guys, yeah. You is morning period. Yeah. Yeah. We are. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'll let you guys go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Daniel will be in touch, and uh, uh, thanks to all the people who are connected. And uh, okay, so um, right. we will stop now, and we'll continue the discussion. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. 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 bye.